Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Charles Simmons, and I'd like to welcome you to the Cord Blood uh, session this afternoon. Check your boarding passes. If you're going to anywhere else, you're in the wrong ballroom. But uh, it's my pleasure to welcome today a uh, wonderful group of thought leaders from around the country who will help us think about the outlook for Cord Blood, all things considered. I think if you look back since the inception of this field about three decades ago, physician investigators have really achieved huge advances with regard to outcomes of umbilical cord blood transplantation. Despite these advances, though, it's very clear that there are a lot of controversies and a lot of gaps in knowledge that still exist with regard to the potential scope of applications, as well as how we achieve adequate safety and quality of these transplantation applications. If you look at the fetal maternal circulation, it's clear that by 12 weeks of gestation that the circulation is mature. And amazingly enough, over the past two decades, it's become clear that there are a lot of stem cell biology related issues to extra embryonic locations as well as fetal locations of stem cell development, including the placenta, including the yolk sac, as well as the fetus itself. The opportunity to harvest cord blood occurs right at the time of birth. And as you see in this photograph, one has access to the extensive placental circulation once the umbilical cord is clamped in a manner that allows the harvest of anywhere from a few cc's up to almost 200 cc's of umbilical cord blood with large macrosomic babies. Strategies that have been developed over the last two decades include this act of harvesting the cord blood, but then going through an elaborate system of banking steps that allow cryopreservation in order to utilize the units at a later time for various transplantation applications. Indeed, evidence supports at this time use of umbilical cord blood for inherited blood disorders, malignancies, and selected inherited metabolic disorders that you'll hear more about this afternoon. Worldwide, if you add it up, there's over 20,000 cord blood transplantation events that occur per year. Ironically, though, if you look around the country, and certainly California is no exception, fewer than 5% of all potential umbilical cord harvesting events are actually pursued. So what are these controversies and gaps? There are many that we could focus on, but I'll call your attention to a few. The first is, what is the range of transplantation applications that current evidence supports? There's the classic hematopoietic type of reconstitution, but also expanding our knowledge base right now with potential regenerative medicine applications, which are exciting and will be a great uh, deal of our time this afternoon. What are the best models to allow collection and archiving of the umbilical cord uh, units themselves? One can have directed donation to a relative. One can have altruistic, allogeneic donation to an unrelated recipient. And finally, there's the exciting area of autologous unit preservation and use at a later time. Quality and safety is, of course, paramount in everyone's mind. And the current public, private, and hybrid models that exist today uh, are constantly undergoing tweaking to make sure that those units that are available will do what they promise to do. And finally, we're challenged with gaps of knowledge, and certainly this afternoon is a good example of trying to repair some of the gaps with regard to what the best evidence is and what those challenges are ahead of us. We not only need to make sure that the public is up to date on what current uses or potential uses of umbilical cord, trans cord uh, blood transplantation might be, but also, indeed, all of the healthcare professionals that are oftentimes the first line of questioning with regard to what the options are for a family at the time they are delivering. It's an exciting era right now. I checked in the last 24 hours just to look at 
clinical trials and see what manifestation there is of innovation in this area. And currently, clinicaltrials.gov chronicles over 161 registered trials right now, ranging from more classic use with hematopoietic reconstitution, but also in the exciting domain of regenerative medicine that we will hear about later today. So as you listen to these three thought leaders this afternoon, I'd like you to keep three goals in mind. The first is to understand the scientific basis for what we are currently using umbilical cord transplantation for. What are these applications? Second, we need to understand what the best practices are that ensure the best possible safety and quality of umbilical cord, both banking as well as transplantation processes themselves. And finally, we are embarking on a period of time in which there's going to be new evidence that accumulates with regard to potential regenerative medicine applications of umbilical cord blood therapeutics. So with that background, first of all, I have no disclosures uh, with regard to the topic today. Um, but I would like to welcome our three thought leaders, Dr. Jennifer Willert uh, from Pediatric Hematology Oncology at the University of California, San Diego and Rady Children's Hospital, Michael Boo, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of the National Marrow Donor Program, and finally, Dr. Michael Cotton, who is in the Division of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at Duke University. Each of these individuals has a wonderful fun of knowledge, and I'm sure I will learn and you will learn a lot this afternoon. So with that, we will transition over to Dr. Willert. The format for this afternoon, what we'll do is go ahead and have our three back-to-back -back talks and you will then have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for a moderated question and answer session uh, in the horseshoe up here. So if you could hold your questions until that time, please. Thank you. So let's just push over. So I um, wanted to thank the organizers of the meeting for inviting me. Um, I, don't, I do have a disclosure in that I've spoken in my attempts to help improve education for expectant mothers on public versus private cord blood banking and have served on speaker honorarium programs for uh, both CBR, Biocord, and STEM site. Um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those companies today, but I am speaking on the importance of improving outreach so that clinicians are educated so that they can in turn educate their parents who come to us. Uh, lastly, and really most importantly from my standpoint, I am an oncologist first and foremost. I take care of children with cancer, and I am also a transplant physician, meaning I do blood and marrow transplants. And I've treated children over the years who have not had access to cellular therapies that they could have otherwise had we not had improved public banking options, particularly improving diverse ethnic background cord blood banking options. And I've seen opportunities where a sibling who could have had their cord blood collected free of charge through reputable programs missed that opportunity and have had, unfortunately, patients who had a short window of time for remission end up not making it and, and not surviving because of that. So I'm here to educate first and foremost. Um, thank you. I uh, would like people to understand the difference between private and public banking and understand that we did not have public banking even as an option in the state of California, despite how ethnically diverse we are, until recently. Um, I am thankful that StemSite has actually started a public banking program right next to us in San Diego and have been advocating for that for many years. We do have limited options here. Uh, we do have legislation in place now in California through AB 52 that takes $2 of every birth certificate now in order to support increased public banking in our state because we are such an ethnically diverse state and the odds of finding a match would be significantly enhanced if we were collecting more units. Um, I want people to know that there are reputable banks and there are unreputable banks and if families are going to be spending their money for private units or trying to save cord blood from a sibling of a potential recipient of those cells, you need to make sure that they are collected appropriately, stored appropriately, and that HLA typing can be done. We only continue to bank only 5% of cord blood units of deliveries yearly. And that's very sad to me. There's only one chance for collection. It's life coming from life. There's nothing controversial about it. Even the Pope endorses it, um, and the Vatican endorses it. Um, it's a non 
manipulated cell source, but that's pluripotent and re can reconstitute the entire hematopoietic system of a child. And in increasingly, we're noticing that there are other ways of forcing those cells into differentiation into neural cells, cardiac cells, and whatnot. I want to point out that the first cord blood transplant done in 88 uh, with Dr. Gluckman, patient actually came from Duke and Joanne Kurtzberg, one of the pioneers in this field. That patient is now 27 years old and has a child of his own. The field has changed dramatically and over the past 10 years, specifically has changed quite a lot and we need to be open-minded especially when we look at the statements made by the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplant and ACOG and know that what's dogma one year can change within a few years and you have only one moment in time to collect these cord blood cells and store them appropriately and we need to be forward thinking because what if we look back five, ten years from now and realize that we made a huge mistake in the way that we were processing things and the way that we were educating people about um, indications. Over the past five years, there's been significant increases in cord blood transplants, mainly because we've found that using two cord blood units for adults with malignancies such as leukemia can achieve equal outcomes to bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells and with a lesser degree of mismatch. There's also been an increase of release from private banks for emerging applications in autologous use, and you'll be hearing more about that. So just to remind people that there's a number of sources of stem cells, umbilical cord is the easiest to obtain by collection when the child is born. Bone marrow involves harvesting a patient with general anesthesia, potential transfusion, and peripheral blood stem cell may or may not involve growth factor and a patient being hooked up to a phoresis machine with sometimes central venous catheter device. I won't go through this uh, except to say that cord blood um, does have a lot of capacity to form all three germ cell layers. It's immediately available compared with um, a adult donor who has to take time off from work, has to arrange for care for their children, has to arrange time for anesthesia. And so if I have a patient with leukemia and we have a short window of time to keep them in remission, we may choose a cord blood unit simply because we can get that in a much more timely fashion and not risk losing that window of remission. This is just showing that it's not really a transplant. It just looks like a simple transfusion. The cord blood is infused through a central catheter in the um, instance of our children uh, for both for indications that I currently use it for and then for emerging applications. Sometimes they can receive their own cells through just a regular peripheral IV. So diseases that currently benefit from transplant with umbilical cord blood need to be uh, carefully distinguish between emerging applications and we need to be forward thinking in what we're collecting for and not just look at the current indications and don't use those statistics just for the current indications. Advantages of cord blood, again, it's immediately available. It's very simple to collect, and I'll talk about a case um, even where obstetricians can be trained, although in an ideal world I would like to see a specific person dedicated to collecting the cells. There's a reduction in time to treatment. There's decrease of certain infections, and you can tolerate a much lower degree of mismatch because the infant has not been exposed immunologically to the world, and therefore they're much less likely to reject them. Interestingly, you would expect that to have perhaps a less graft versus leukemia or graft versus tumor effect, but in fact it doesn't. And there are researchers at Minnesota combining two cord units, even for infants that would have enough of a cell dose from a single unit, simply because they're seeing more graft versus leukemia. Uh, at our recent ASBMT meeting, which is the big international cord, uh, transplant meeting, uh, impressive data yet again, this has been on three separate years now, showing that unrelated cord blood for adults with leukemia shows just as good of outcomes and it's becoming the stem cell source of choice. So public banking continues to be a huge priority on a, a worldwide level. I want to talk about one of the most important reasons that I'm here is if there are a number of indications for transplantable illness some of them malignant like leukemia, some of them non-malignant like thalassemia or sickle cell disease, aplastic anemia, and a myriad of others. And those siblings may have access to programs through reputable banks. Some, in other states, it's through specific, um, specific collection programs where you want to make sure that the person collecting that cord blood is trained. And a lot of the training in California for collections has actually come from the private banking industry where obstetricians have been doing so many collections. And in fact, I have a patient recently with a six-year-old with ALL whose other siblings did not match him. He relapsed. We had a short period of time to keep him in remission. Mom was eight months pregnant. Thankfully, the obstetrician had a lot of 
private experience and we weren't able to arrange for someone to just specifically get the cells. Um, I do have to disclose that the kit used for that and the program that we're using for this now because it's an NMDP sanctioned program is stem site and the sibling was born. We were able to do HLA typing right away. Thankfully, he matched. We had a wonderful, wonderful cell dose. There was no contamination. I'm happy to report that he's four and a half months out from that transplant and grafted wonderfully and did quite well. But you need to have a collection facility who has the appropriate collection devices and people trained in that collection. And preferably that comes from experience that could be obtained in both the private and the public world. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I'll let our, our future uh, um, speakers discuss this, but there are a number of regenerative medicine uh, applications, predominantly in the neonatal realm of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, uh, cerebral palsy, and there's a lot of emerging uh, data coming out of uh, Brazil, Florida, and now Australia using autologous, meaning coming from their own cells, um, cord blood for type 1 diabetes, and it improves the honeymoon period. We don't know how long this is going to last, but there are areas that are, are emerging, and we need to continue to think um, in the future. Um, I'm going, who needs to receive information? All expected parents. And I don't think it's fair to coerce a parent either from marketing for private banking or by trying to coerce them into public banking because it's for the greater good of society. We don't do that in any other aspect of medicine. I think a family should be able to make the decision based on their own resources, their family history, their ethnic background, and what's available to them from a public banking standpoint or private depending on where they're currently living. And they should choose, if they're choosing a private bank, one that the cells are going to be worthwhile because otherwise it could be potentially a waste of their valuable resources. My dream is that all cord blood banks will be banked for both public and private use. I would love to see a day where perhaps we have it available for both, and HLA typing is done up front. Uh, Dr. Kurtzberg and I were at a meeting last week, and she presented evidence um, and discussed at last ASBMT. If some of these emerging applications for autologous use come to be true, we need to rethink our current paradigm and perhaps think of having that unit available for the family that donated it publicly for at least a year so that if they need it for themselves, they're able to retrieve it. I'd like to see funding to support so that people that perhaps don't have the financial means but do want to privately bank have a better um, ability to do so. I'd like there to be outreach and support for the underserved, and we need improved education for informed consent. Uh, I mentioned the legislation in California. There is no uh, cord blood banking education uh, mandated through ACOG. Obstetricians aren't trained in their residency or fellowship, and it's not discussed in pediatric training either. And so just know that we need to do a better job educating ourselves so that we can educate our patients and families. Thank you, Jennifer. That's a great overview. We'll segue right into the regenerative medicine topic that you referred to. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Cotton from the Division of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at Duke University. And he will talk with us about clinical trials of autologous cells for brain injury in infants and children. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, uh, Charles, for inviting me to speak, and welcome to everybody. I'm really honored to be up here as a neonatologist, more of a clinician scientist than a scientist clinician. That's my disclosure. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and lead into our uh, phase one trial of use of autologous cells for this um, indication, a little bit of background on it, um, and a little bit of the results that we've seen so far, mostly centering on safety and feasibility. So HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or perinatal asphyxia, is caused by a lack of or decrease in blood flow and oxygen delivery to the baby during the intrapartum or pr prior to birth that results in the baby presenting with an abnormal neurologic exam. It happens in about 2.5 per 1,000 births in the U.S. per year, um, so about 10,000 cases per year of encephalopathy. Um, and if we look at the kids with the moderate to severe encephalopathy, about half are going to end up either dying or with significant uh, neurocognitive uh, problems for the rest of their lives. It accounts for about uh, between 15 and 20 percent, or close to 15 percent of the cerebral palsy cases in the U.S. per year. Um, but the CP that the kids with HIE get is somewhat different, probably more severe than other CP uh, varieties that are, that are out there. 
you can see from the slide um, that the documentation is that the kids with CP secondary to HIE or that goes along with HIE, they're two times more likely to have a severe composite disability and also three times more likely to die in the first five postnatal years. So, so this disease is a, is a big problem. So looking at the, the mechanism of disease and what are the targets maybe for, for interventions, we can see that there's a couple of, of important parts. When you look just at the part in the box, um, this is a slide from Donna Ferrero from UCSF who's really done great things for the field as far as understanding the, the pathophysiology of the disease as well as the interventions that might be useful. So in Donna's article and review article in New England Journal, which is a great article, um, she hones in on the, 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 the space enclosed in the box, that there's an early part in the hours, first hours post-injury where cells die and there's necrosis. And then there's also set up for longer cell death that's caused by a, a process called apoptosis or processes related to apoptosis that go on for days to weeks um, postnatally. During that process, what adds to the death uh, is inflammation and then abnormal repair, and repair that's modified by inflammation. Um, and all that might stem around excited toxicity. It might stem from the, the hypoxia. There's a lot of cellular things going on. The problem with humans is we never know exactly, most of the time, when the injury actually happens. So timing the time for response and best time for intervention is a real challenge. But what we've done in the clinic so far is to introduce hypothermia as the, as the, the way we treat kids that are born with, with neonatal encephalopathy, secondary to hypoxic ischemia. Um, you can see in the picture in the upper corner there, hypothermia has been around for a while. First is used post-op for people who had brain surgery for, for brain tumors as an adjunct therapy. And then it's advanced now to what we've uh, seen in the clinic. The baby with the little hat on is uh, uh, a training picture from the Cool Cap study, which was the first study published, pivotal trial published, for use of, of hypothermia for kids with HIE that showed benefit. And on the other side, the whole body hypothermia slide is what we do at Duke and many other sites are using. There's a slide from the NICHD's multicenter trial of use of whole body hypothermia instead of just a selective head cooling. Now, if you look at the 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 impact of use of hypothermia, you can see in this bar graph of the four main pivotal phase three clinical trials. The control group incidents of death or severe to mo or moderate to severe morbidity are in the red bars, and the, the treatment groups with hypothermia are in the blue bars across the way in all four of the trials. And you can see a fairly consistent effect. They're all positive. Uh, they're all going in the right direction, but you can see in the cooled group that there's still 40 to 50 percent of the kids are dying or having impairment over the long term. So that's where we come in with saying there's got to be adjunct therapies. Now, there's several adjunct therapies out there that are in the pipeline, including erythropoietin, uh, inhaled xenon, uh, as well as other things that have been chronicled well by Dr. Ferrero and others um, that are in the pipeline and are, are very promising. At Duke, we have Joanne Kurtzberg is a treasure at our place, and she had, she kind of brought up to our, our minds the idea about using autologous cord blood cells. She'd accumulated evidence in kids with inherited metabolic diseases where there was disruption of neurologic development and destruction of myelin, uh, especially with Crabbe's disease. In this slide, the figure shows a survival curve of kids transplanted with allogeneic cells um, at different times. First, the asymptomatic transplant, the top line where there's 100% survival. Those kids had Crabbe's genotypes, siblings of, of uh, full siblings of kids who had the full phenotype most severe where they die in the first few uh, years of life. And those kids were transplanted very early before they became symptomatic and survived. The middle line are those who are transplanted post-symptom onset, uh, not nearly as good, but some improvement and some survival, um, and then the untreated group. Many of you have probably seen Joanne's slide where she shows presence of a donor cell in the CNS of a kid who was transplanted after uh, they were symptomatic who later died, uh, showing just that the transplanted cells did get into the CNS. So that helped our argument and helped Joanne's argument along, but we needed those animal studies that were alluded to in this morning's sessions. 
So there's rodent models as well as uh, we've partnered with uh, investigators in Chicago to look at a rabbit model of cerebral palsy well, where there's an intrauterine injury, where there's a balloon inflated in the uterine artery to cause lack of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the fetal rabbits. And then what was seen in the animals born with a CP phenotype who were rescued with cord blood cells, the behavioral benefits are in the big box where all the, all the uh, measures of phenotype and many of the kids who, or many of the animals who are born with a severe phenotype improved. Uh, there is a lack of our improvement in hypertonicity, improvement in posture and locomotion. Not 100%, but there was improvement. Now, the caveat is the small box on the right is our survival curve. The animals that got the full dose of cells, which I must uh, tell you is a pretty big volume for a tiny rabbit baby, uh, their survival was not as good in those that received cord blood cells. We repeated this study with a lower dose and didn't see the discrepancy in survival, so that was, that was somewhat reassuring. So with the combination of Joanne's experience with the, with the allogeneic transplants and the kids with severe uh, metabolic disease, as well as some amount of animal data, which didn't really point to the cells taking the place of the damaged cells, but rather helping with the repair process or, or decreasing or modifying the inflammatory process post-injury, we embarked on a phase one trial of use of autologous cells for kids with HIE that met the criteria for the neonatal research network um, hypothermia trial. So the basic idea was we get the OBs to obtain consent for collection if they didn't already have public cord blood banking consent. Um, we'd collect blood and then see if the baby met criteria. And then if there were adequate cells and the baby met criteria, we'd do infusions and just see what happened. The infusions were with fresh cells in the first 72 postnatal hours, up to four infusions, one in the first 12 postnatal hours, then at 24, 48, and 72 um, hours. And then we'd just see what happened, if that was safe, if, how the babies responded, if anything happened in that acute time. These are pretty sick uh, babies. Um, so the main thing I'll tell you about now is that we have our feasibility results from 15 kids um, summarized in these next two slides. Verbal consent was needed for two-thirds, so there wasn't a lot of prior public cord blood, blood collection consent obtained um, in our population. Um, I can tell you also that's not on this slide that we had to collect about five units for every one that got used. So uh, OBs would, would perceive a risk for a bad delivery uh, about five times more often than one would actually occur and then a baby would, would have trouble. Um, the volume collected ranged from three cc's to 170. Uh, the three cc uh, collection, we were actually able to get one dose of cells. The dose that we used was based on the cord blood transplant um, literature, so not hugely uh, replete and strong data to guide us, but it was what had been given to small kids before. Um, so one to five times 10 to the seventh was the dose we selected, and that baby who had three cc's collected um, was able to get one dose of cells. Many uh, were able to get the cells in the first 24 hours. Few were able to get them in the first six postnatal hours. Um, most of the babies had enough cells collected to give four infusions. And the average infusion volume, as you know, or many of you may know, neonatologists are always worried about over giving too much fluid to babies and having fluid overload as a problem was about four cc's uh, per infusion. So most of these babies being near term or term, that was not a big issue. We didn't have a problem with that. The big question is efficacy, and you'll probably have to wait 10 years to know. Um, in this size of a trial, no control group, there's no way we can even begin to talk about efficacy. But again, we can talk about safety, and we can present what happened to our kids. So one out of the 15 uh, died. Um, one kid developed pulmonary hypertension with nitric oxide after the first dose of cells. Um, Pressors during infusions were common, but they were fairly common uh, among a, a, a concurrent semi-control group, so kids who had not had cells collected, we monitored what their outcomes were as well, and that's in the text uh, bullet points below. One baby who was a 34, 35 weaker had a GI perforation subsequent to infusion, but not in a time-related uh, uh, kind of uh, period. 80%, um, 12 out of 15 kids were feeding PO at discharge. And this matches up pretty well to, to what was going on or what was presented in the ICE trial, one of the other cooling trials. So it matches up pretty well with the treatment groups in cooling, not a, a home run, but it, it's going to be hard to, to show much of a, a benefit there. So 
our phase one trial, we're still enrolling. Uh, we, we have an IRB approval to enroll up to 25 kids. Um, we've, uh, now we're thinking about where do we go from here. Well, one is thinking about the manipulated cells. You guys heard a lot about that this morning, and we constantly hear a lot about it. We're taking the position that if we don't manipulate the cells, it may be safer right now to give them to babies who have issues. Um, that may lower the likelihood of great success. We don't know because we don't know if mixing up, having the whole mix of cells is there's some secret in there that, that we're not going to find in the lab necessarily that's the right uh, population of cells that needs to be uh, manipulated. But certainly there's biologic plausibility for manipulation and neural stem cells or oligodendrocyte directed cells that could be better. So those studies need to go on. We're talking with people with Sunny Jewel at University of Washington about using a primate model and testing, the testing these um, un unmanipulated uh, cells in a primate model of perinatal asphyxia. We need to study and worry about the timing of dosing, maybe post-cooling, um, and in that latent phase of injury and, and repair, maybe that would be a better time to give cells. We're not sure. So we need to think about that study as well. And the amount of dosing needs to be worked out. Um, so we're in the process of planning a multi-center phase two. We have an IND for our single site work, but not multi-site. So we still have a lot of, a lot of work to do. Um, and with that, I'm going to close uh, so there's more time for discussion at the end and thank all those at Duke. Rebecca Haley's in the audience. She was a champion who really helped us get our funding from the uh, CTSA grant at Duke. Um, and Robertson Foundation has helped a lot. And our co partners in Chicago and also a, a parallel study now going on in Singapore uh, just got started. So hopefully our experience will relay it to the public, and uh, we'll try to answer questions and do the right thing as we move forward. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, everyone was aware from the uh, keynote uh, comments this morning that the real emphasis of this summit is on translational medicine. And I think the translational approaches that Dr. Willert uh, summarized in terms of our current applications as well as what the future has in store with uh, Dr. Cotton's presentation uh, makes that all very fresh in our mind. One of the other things that we obviously are concerned about has to do with safety and quality, first do no harm. And I think there's no one uh, better qualified uh, than Michael Boo, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Marrow Donor Program with regard to how safety and quality, and I guess we have to use the R, R word, regulation, uh, enters the whole series of processes that lead up to all these good things happening. So welcome, Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Simmons, and thanks to, for the organizers for inviting me. Um, and we're going to switch gears a little bit here. I don't have any disclosures to make. Um, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about regulation and its impact on these emerging and established indications and how quickly or how, uh, how much of a limitation these regulations may, might uh, prove to the growth of um, uh, new studies uh, using cord blood as its source. So we'll talk about the current statistics on cord blood use, uh, provide an overview of cord blood regulation in the U.S., compare this to a couple of other jurisdictions, and then discuss the potential issues of regulation in cord blood. So this slide is a NMDP facilitated transplants um, since 1987, the beginning of NMDP, National Marrow Donor Program, or NMDP, is the uh, national registry of the United States, and it maintains a registry of, about, of both adult donors and cord blood units for unrelated transplantation. And as we can see, in particular, the green of these bars has grown over the last uh, five or six years as cord blood has become more of an accepted source of graft for unrelated transplantation. However, this, uh, this growth over the last two years in particular and continuing into 2011 has been uh, flat, roughly flat, if we look at the United States as a whole and not just those transplants facilitated through uh, uh, NMDP. So we're seeing some slowing down of the growth of cord blood transplant in the U.S. and a similar experience internationally. But I should note that uh, as we look at this slide, 
Um, of the cord blood transplants um, in the U.S., 40 percent, or just under 40 percent, uh, in the current year are for uh, ethnic and racial minorities. Uh, this compares to an overall experience at the NMDP of about 17 percent from all graft sources. So cord blood, while its growth may be slowing, has delivered on its promise of providing a source of cells for those patients who have not been able to obtain an appropriate source from the adult donor registry. This is a slide showing total transplants of cord blood units provided around the world. Uh, Dr. Willard indicated about 20,000, and that's correct. There has been estimated to be around 500 um, autologous or uh, related cord blood transplants as well, but the 20,000 number generally is assigned to unrelated transplant. Those autologous or related uh, transplants has actually been growing quite rapidly in the last couple of years based on some of the studies that uh, you heard Dr. Willer talk about and Dr. Cotton refer to. So we're seeing some more use of autologous in some uh, interesting studies currently. But worldwide, it's about 20,000. As I indicated, um, the um, use of cord blood, the growth in the use of cord blood for unrelated transplant is slowing. Um, now, uh, this slide shows a significant uh, use of cord blood in the adult population. Uh, the uh, U.S. situation is such that the, we do have more adults now uh, receiving uh, cord blood, but not quite to the same ratio. Uh, versus children. So this shows the uh, international exchange of these uh, cord blood units um, uh, necessary for transplantation. The international numbers uh, are about between 30 and 35 percent of the total uh, cord blood transplants used. And why this is important is because in, when we talk about regulation of a product such as cord blood, we're talking about a product that might uh, go over international boundaries and be subject to both the regulations in the country of origin as well as the regulations in the country of the recipient. And so regulation becomes an important issue not just within country but across countries. So the United States has an approach established by the FDA. The FDA um, uh, signaled their intent to uh, regulate uh, cord blood as well as all cellular products in 1997 and have been developing that regulatory scheme um, over the last few years since that time to where they have now uh, pronounced, at least on the cord blood, their intention to regulate. Um, and they regulate based upon three scales, basically two scales, one for autologous and related allogeneic that are uh, regulated under 21 CFR Part 1271, which basically is a safety and GTP regulatory scheme, and then a, a more significant or, or a more... Um, a rigorous uh, regulation of unrelated uh, allogeneic or units to be used for unrelated allogeneic purposes, um, treated more under as a biologic drug um, type of regulation with requirements of complying with GMPs, um, good manufacturing processes, as well as the good tissue practices, et cetera. So a more rigorous uh, requirement around safety, but also uh, potency and use applies to unrelated use of cord blood. When the FDA announced its, uh, its uh, regulatory scheme for cord blood, it did so using two guidances for industry. The first uh, was issued in October 20, 2009, and this provided for the licensing of cord blood, um, uh, and in this guidance referred to uh, re licensing of units that were min minimally manipulated, unrelated allogeneic placental umbilical cord blood intended for hematopoietic reconstitution for specific indications. So what they said is we will regulate or license only units used in a, of a certain type, minimally manipulated, and used for a certain set of indications. Separately, um, at that time, they issued a draft guidance for um, unlicensed units and how they might be accessed. That draft guidance was issued in a final guidance in uh, August of this year. What units will be licensed under this regulatory, regulatory scheme? Um, obviously, the units that meet the regulatory requirements that comply with the FDA's approval of the biologic license that the cord blood, unit, cord blood bank applies for. Um, these will be those units going forward based upon the conformance with that BLA. But the FDA also permitted or will permit previously manufactured uh, cord blood units, units already in the bank, if they were manufactured under the same standards as approved uh, for the BLA. 
Also, <clears throat> the FDA indicated it might uh, approve the licensing of units that were manufactured prior to receipt of the BLA or approval of the BLA, if, uh, even if we were using a different uh, process than was approved under the BLA, if comparability can be demonstrated. Not only did the FDA regulate units to be licensed, but also regulated what uses those units could be used for. And this is consistent with its intention to regulate cord blood as a biologic drug, not as a blood type product. So it is the licensing is limited to specific indications which are listed here and for use in unrelated transplant. So the FDA recognized that the, um, uh, once the BLA uh, were approved for the banks, that there would be a number of, a vast number of units in these banks that needed and could be used for and were needed for therapeutic purposes. And so recognizing this, they issued the IND I referred to, or the, the guidance for an IND that I referred to, which allowed access to the units in the banks um, that would not meet the requirements of the BLA that would be approved by the FDA going forward. These units could be units not uh, that are um, units in non-domestic banks that do not have a license. That would be <clears throat> units in the international community. Uh, it was anticipated that not many of the international banks <clears throat> would go through the process of obtaining a BLA as they were likely to be regulated under their own country's regulatory scheme. Cord blood units in domestic banks that were collected prior to license data would also could come under this IND. So those that did not meet those three um, conditions or um, qualifications I refer to either for licensing. And then new cord blood units that do not meet license criteria but are a satisfactory alternative. Here the uh, FDA anticipated that there might be populations with certain indications uh, or certain um, indications that would not meet the FDA uh, uh, safety requirements or I, um, uh, indications, but with which, um, because of the need for a good HLA diversity in the registry, uh, it would be appropriate to continue to collect those units so patients would have an opportunity for a match. These units are subject to and can only be used for the indications that um, the FDA approved for licensed units. So this uh, gets into an interesting point that we'll talk about in a minute. But as we looked and surveyed the uh, regulations of other European, other countries, including European Union member states, to see what conflicts might exist, we noted that there is quite a, a variety of regulatory schemes out there, even within the EU. And the EU has a, um, uh, a directive, a protocol or, um, uh, that is out there that requires all EU members to regulate uh, this cellular product along with other cellular products. But the EU countries have uh, had have been very has demonstrated variation in timing and definition, the extent uh, when the regulations are going to be in place and what will be regulated. Generally, the EU members have adopted oversight similar to blood regulations, so they are regulating the quality and safety of the product, not necessarily the use of the product. And this is going to and they uh, they address export and import within their own countries, which varies by country. So some countries require registration of foreign manufacturers. That is to say, they require that if a U.S. cord blood bank was to export a unit into uh, uh, the Great Britain, for instance, United Kingdom, that cord blood bank would have to have registered with the United Kingdom and be under its um, registry requirements. Similarly, the U.S. requires registration of all uh, cord blood. Uh, banks that intend to import units into the U.S. So there is variation in the regulatory scheme. And the um, issue here is then how do we deal with this when we're asking, when the transplant centers want a unit from an international cord blood bank? What it would it do to get at those units? And the U.S. has, um, uh, the NMDP has developed an IND to allow for access to units that come from outside the U.S. as well as units in cord blood banks in the U.S. that will not meet licensing requirements. But the um, but the, an individual transplant center could have an IND. So there's um, a, a need for now an overlay in terms of access of two cord blood banks from around the, cord blood units around the world that requires the use of an IND to access those units in addition to whatever IND is required within the institutions themselves. 
So what are some quick issues? We have two-tiered regulatory scheme that I referred to before between related and auto versus unrelated. Um, is there different safety requirements? There should not be, but there is different manufacturing requirements, so there may be quality concerns. Oversight of imported units. Um, NMDP has an IND that will allow uh, import of units from outside the U.S., but we have not gone and inspected every one of those banks. We have not examined every one of those banks' regulatory requirements. We have accepted uh, a, uh, that they have been able to document good manufacturing or good tissue practices, but we have not determined that through an inspection. Limited access for non-specified diseases. What if a transplant center wants to use a cord blood unit that, um, uh, for a non-indicated disease? Well, if it's a licensed unit, it could be used on an off-label basis. If it's an unlicensed unit, it comes through an access IND and it strictly is prohibited from using it for a non-indicated, uh, non not approved indication, and therefore that transplant center will have to have an IND for that specific use. And what happens with regenerative medicine uh, when we start talking about manipulation? How will these units be accessed? Will the IND that each transplant center have have to address the question of access from each individual bank as a part of their CMC section for their IND? Um, will they then for, therefore have multiple IND coordination issues? These are issues that I think are now uh, upon us as we start to um, apply the regulatory scheme that the FDA has, um, has pronounced. So with that a bit of teaser on those issues, I think I'll stop now and uh, turn it over to you all for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we referred to controversies and gaps, and certainly one of the things we don't want to leave is a gap with regard to questions that may have come up during these three excellent presentations. So just to draw your attention back to our original set of goals, we'd like to solicit questions. Uh, all three of our speakers uh, are here, and uh, we'll turn it over to you in terms of pressing issues you would like to hear more discussion about. There are two mics here, and uh, we'll be happy to field these. Yes. Hi, thank you for, for the excellent talks. I just have a general question. Why the hate for the private cord blood banks that we see from different societies, medical societies? And do you think that has diminished, or have we learned anything new? So, Is that changing? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to take a stab at that. I, um, uh, I think part of the problem is people have looked, the major institutions have looked at the current applications and have thought of private banking as taking away from public banking and diminishing public banked units. And as a pediatrician and transplanter, seven years ago I would have been towing the party line, but we actually didn't have any public banking options in California. And parents were going to all sorts of different banks, many of them that really didn't have a reputable track record. Um, I was also a developmental biologist when I was at Stanford and knew that there may be regenerative medicine things on the horizon and that we as clinicians owed ourselves to become educated and not just toe the party line because as you know it takes a long time for dogma to change. Um, Dr. Glickman and her colleagues just published a nice paper through ASBMT kind of showing that there are some emerging applications now that do look safe, at least from a pilot standpoint. Dr. Kurtzberg and others are pioneering work that also supports that. And so I think we need to rethink um, the hatred for the private banks. I also know that it's been through private banking and the obstetricians getting training on how to collect units that I have had success in getting units collected from siblings who desperately needed cord blood collected appropriately. So it's, I, I'm hoping that we get to a place where nobody hates the other one, but that private banking is looked at as um, having perhaps less different stringent guidelines compared to public banking, although in theory one would like to see it somewhat regulated. We don't know the cell dose that's needed for these emerging applications, and um, families should have the right to be informed and make their own decision. So that's... Yes, the rear microphone. Uh, this is uh, to Dr. Cotton. Uh, addressing the first thing about the scientific basis for presumably cord blood being sort of on the fetal side of the placenta is exactly the same as the blood that's already going around the fetus. 
So how does giving another five or ten or fifteen mils of cord blood do anything to the infant who suffered hypoxia? I, I'm not right. so sure not how that the, works. It's not just the red, the cells are red cell and volume reduced. So it's the nucleated cell fraction. And so it's you take whatever you get and you concentrate it down and resuspend it in about a 20 cc um, head of starch solution. And then you take your aliquot to give one to five times 10 to the seventh nucleated cells. So it's, it's a pretty big dose of nucleated cells over and above what the kid might have already been getting with the late cord, cord and you think clamping. And what do you think they're doing to uh, reverse the um, hypoxia? So I don't think they're reversing hypoxia. I think from Meyer's work and Pimentel Coelho in Brazil, um, the, there's some pretty good evidence to say they're modifying the inflammatory response. Um, and I think that's where it's, it's coming from. It's not a home run of regenerating the brain. Other questions? Yes. Well, I. So yes, regulation is appropriate for any biologic product that you're going to use for human treatment. So that I think there was a pro, it was appropriate that there be some set of standards established that would apply to all banks so that transplant centers would be assured that each unit acquired, no matter what bank was acquired from, met some minimum standards. It is arguable, that, the, however, that the FDA may have gone a little too far with the regulatory scheme, but we don't know yet. We're, there's, there's been only three BLA applications actually filed as of this date. One has gone, undergone public review. Um, there's been, I think, uh, it, two uh, inspections or three inspections um, uh, of banks. We don't know how rigorous the FDA will be in the application of their standards to individual banks. We are concerned uh, it may be more rigorous than can be afforded because it is a very marginal business today. Right, so by the end of this year, right, the, the public banks have to apply, correct? They have to apply by October 20th or at least demonstrate that they're making good faith efforts toward application. We expect that it'll be 18 months to two years before all of the banks in the U.S. have actually gone through the BLA process. But one would certainly hope that at some point in the future, the same safety and quality standards were utilized no matter what the uh, donor and recipient uh, you know, happened to be, what the banking model happened to be. But as you're pointing out, that's not where we're starting from with these FDA regulations. Yes, sir. It's certainly possible. Um, the uh, banks, by and large, have claimed that they have not made money at this uh, business, and so the additional costs that would be imposed by having to hire staff to oversee regulatory compliance, as well as the potential capital costs to modify uh, 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 facilities, may cause some of them to go out of business. We have not heard that as of today. Uh, the banks, many banks, are still investigating the, um, the uh, requirements. Certainly these are federal standards, and yet you hear some, uh, Dr. Willard was talking about a state-based uh, funding mechanism, and would you like to comment on how uh, state banks may utilize some of these resources? Yeah, so um, at this time, the uh, University of California has uh, been given the authority to administrate the monies generated from the uh, birth certificates. Um, there is, as I understand, um, some of that money will be set aside specifically to have collectors trained at the facilities and help identify facilities um, that have a higher uh, ethnic diversity because that's the goal of this is to increase ethnically diverse units within our public arsenal. Um, I would like to see that money kept in the state of California. I'm born and raised here. I was actually born at Alta Bates, which is one of the first public bank options uh, that STEM site helps support. Um, and I understand that there are some consideration to perhaps fly units collected out of our state to Texas, for instance. Um, I'd like to see either 
units go to Stemsci that already has a very nice public track in California and is really one of the biggest public banks in California at only certain centers though. Uh, I'd like to see a broader outreach. I'd love to see collaboration with the University of California where I'm actually a professor and did all my training. Um, and I, I think the dream of them all working together is, is going to happen. Um, but I think we'll need some lobbying and, and people within our community to make sure that that money is spent wisely, that it goes to the right places, that it goes to the right hospitals, and that um, we could have a model where providers are trained to collect, and that's certainly available at most of the centers in our state right now. But ideally, we'd have funding to support someone who's there dedicated to doing the good collection so that the obstetrician can take care of the mom and baby, pediatrician can take care of the baby, especially in the higher risk settings. Other, yes, up front here. You talked about minimal manipulations to cord blood stem cells. So how would we, we define what minimal manipulation is? How much manipulation is minimal? How much manipulation is more than minimally manipulated? I guess I'll ask the clinicians to. From my standpoint, um, you need to reduce some degree of volume. Um, there's a lot of controversy over red cell versus plasma depletion. I can tell you we use both units and they do fine from an engraftment standpoint and safety standpoint. Um, they do need to be washed and processed appropriately. Um, for the neonatal indications, you definitely need to volume reduce them because you're giving uh, highly viscous and cellular product to someone who's got a small intravascular volume. Um, I think those are my main answers. I, I personally don't think that for emerging applications at this time we should be manipulating these cells at all until we have pilot and more extensive safety data from it. Um, and for malignant disorders, uh, I think the role of expansion, so manipulating them to expand it so that if you only had one unit that met the criteria for cell dose uh, for an adult, if you were able to expand it, I think in a highly high risk malignant situation, I think it's worth taking those risks. But for things like non-malignant disorders, thalassemia, sickle cell, and these emerging applications at this point, I, I would prefer that they're not manipulated. Do you, Dr. Cotton may have it. Um, the question might have also been about you know adding neural growth factor to trying to direct it more toward neurons. And, and I'm, I think you alluded to that a little bit in, in, in your regulatory talk. I think that starts getting a little more experimental. Um, certainly it would fall within something that would need an IND before you would have to do it and it goes back to the FDA and who's on your panel reviewing the IND. But I think that would be more experimental. Yes. Isn't, isn't the regulatory intent to separate um, units which have been treated as Dr. Willard says um, just to solve viscosity issues and get rid of red cells that might cause a problem as opposed to both in vitro expansion and induced differentiation so that those were a different category in terms of regulation. So I think the definition of minimal manipulation is all of the things that make it a product that you can infuse safely in terms of volume, hemolysis, things like that, as opposed to trying to make those cells do something else biologically after they've been harvested. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the, the FDA has indicated, or at least the belief in the community, is that a, a, taking something out of the product probably <coughs> is not more than mini, min, minimally manipulated. So if there's some T cell depletion, it's not going to offend that standard. But if you are introducing something, um, be it another agent or another set of cells, or changing something through uh, genetic modification, you are manipulating that. And they, they require a separate IND in investigation for that purpose. Notwithstanding the regulations, uh, certainly cryopreservation itself uh, in different hands uh, can have marked impact on the viability of cells that are utilized for transplantation. So I think currently, you know, that uh, methodological or process issue is a, a major concern. Yes. Well, I have some theories, and I'll let the transplant centers talk as well. I mean, I think there's a couple of things at work here. Gen transplants generally are slowing down. I think there's some capacity issues, certainly in this country, uh, concerning the 
uh, whether there's a, a sufficient number of staff as well as facilities to continue the growth of 10 percent or more that we've seen the last few years. I think the cost of cord blood transplant and the, uh, is, is a differentiator. I think it uses facilities more intensely than uh, adult sourced. So there is some economic decision going on there as well. Perhaps we're uh, feeling the third or fourth year of our economic crisis. We're seeing that people, particularly minority populations, don't have the financial resources to pursue transplant, though, as I said before, we, I think we see the number of cord blood transplants in the minority population continuing at the same pace. Um, so I think there's a number of vari variations that are going on out there, and, and maybe we're all waiting, the transplant community is waiting for that next big um, finding to push the uh, use to the next level. So, I, all the, so in pediatrics, we don't do the same number of transplants as in the adult world. And in the adult world, they're doing double, trans, double cord transplants. But at our center, we have, over the past two to three years, done an increasing number of unrelated cord transplants for high-risk malignancies for patients that were very ethnically diverse, uh, coming from multiple ethnic backgrounds, who I know would not have found a match even a few years ago. And you know they're tolerating as low as a four out of six mismatch. And the majority of them have done remarkably well and are running around and not having a lot of graft versus host disease, though they did have some complications earlier on and talking to my transplant colleagues across the country I think in pediatrics we are seeing a bigger number dr. boo might be able to tell it that our numbers in pediatrics are going up at least and not plateauing um, they have no. they've been fairly steady um, okay. the growth has been in the adult side the, okay. I think the children by 50 percent of the transplants now are cord blood in and children. do you think part of that um, we could improve upon that if we in increase the ethnic diversity of the current publicly banked units have we met a plateau simply because we're not doing enough outreach in centers and, and increasing public donations in areas of ethnic diversity like in California? Yeah, I think there's, that's an issue well worth looking at. We're spending quite a bit of time right. looking at that very issue. Perhaps another version of that question is what is the unmet demand potentially in the United States for cord blood transplantation? Could I just say that, that newborn screening for the mm -hmm. inherited metabolic disorders is mm -hmm. pretty select, but with new technologies and doing a panel of lysosomal storage diseases, as has been piloted in Illinois and in Missouri, um, is likely to turn up more of those kids with crevets and hurlers, and, right. and that's going to increase the potential demand for those, for those babies. Mm -hmm. So we, in the U.S., the, we estimate the current indications would suggest a demand of somewhere between 10 and 12,000 potential unrelated donor transplants, um, which could be served by either adult or cord blood sources. Um, about 5,000 or so in the U.S. will receive a transplant this year. 22% um, uh, of them would be cord blood transplants. So now we're, I think we're pushing up against the barriers such as uh, having a good, uh, still an acceptable HLA match. Um, um, we're into insurance barriers. There are a number of other issues. I think that next, uh, our ability to grow is going to depend upon us removing some barriers that aren't the easy ones. I think we have time perhaps for one more question. Yes. So when I say 10 to 12,000, uh, that is a U.S., that is our U.S. calculation. The U.S. has, uh, provided, well, there's a, all kinds of studies, but the U.S. has provided about 40 percent of the transplants. If we just extrapolate that, there's at least 25,000 plus patients in the uh, countries where there's established transplant programs that, that could be met, and we're meeting about 14,000 uh, uh, worldwide. So with that, we'd like to thank the organizers once again. We'd like to thank all three of our speakers, Jennifer, Michael, and Michael. And most of all, thank you for your attention and questions. We'll be happy to, we'll be happy to entertain additional questions up front here. Thank you. <laughs>